My name is Chris Coleman and I have been involved for most of my life with uh, uh, HF Radio, um, initially uh, as uh, a radio amateur and then later on professionally. Uh, the idea of this talk is to uh, put into a, a form that's hopefully digestible by radio amateurs some of the more esoteric issues that affect uh, propagation at high frequencies, that HF and in particular the over the horizon propagation. HF radio is radio technology in the frequency range from 3 to 30 megahertz, providing long distance communication without expensive cables or satellites, but unfortunately the bandwidth is limited. In our age of ever increasing demand on bandwidth through video, uh, internet, all this kind of thing, this has led many to predict the death of radio, uh, of HF radio. However, uh, at this point, I think uh, the remarks of Mark Twain, uh, when a newspaper prematurely reported his death, uh, these remarks are appropriate. He wrote back to the newspaper saying, reports of my death have been over-exaggerated. Well, I think this remark is approach appropriate to HF radio since uh, it's still very important technology. For example, uh, there is Digio Radio, Digital Radio Mondial, um, or a, day, a DOB type mode for HF uh, broadcasting. Aid agencies heavily uh, utilize HF. Emergency services, the military, all heavily utilize HF because it provides um, communication that could be put down uh, very, very quickly without a massive technological infrastructure. Other uses, especially over the past five, uh, uh, 30 years, have been over the horizon radar, which has provided um, extensive uh, surveillance over very, very large regions at a very small price. And for countries such as Australia, this is important, with a huge area to survey and not a huge economy to support a large system of satellites and um, UHF um, microwave radars. Of course, last but not least, uh, hams or radio amateurs are the major users of the HF spectrum and uh, continue to uh, um, trailblaze this area with digital modes and all kinds of techniques. Okay, well, let's uh, talk about some basics of radio waves to start to make sure we're all on the same page and uh, <coughs> understand what we're talking about. A wave. A wave is an art, 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 arbitrary disturbance that travels at a finite speed and can transport energy and information. Water waves on a pond are an excellent example. Disturbances travel as ripples with finite speed and can impart energy to a floating object far away. Electromagnetic fields can also support radio uh, waves, as was predicted by Maxwell in his theoretical work. This work was then verified in the laboratory by Hertz, and his experimental work showed that radio waves were feasible and did exist. It was up to Marconi, the engineer, then to take up this idea and turn it into uh, technology. Well, Hertz had originally said, well, radio waves are very interesting, but they'll never amount to much. How wrong he was, because Marconi was able to fiddle around with uh, Hertz's apparatus, make some modifications. In particular, he uh, introduced the cohere for detecting the radio waves, whereas um, Hertz had had to use a very minute uh, uh, spark gap and use a microscope to see sparks jumping across it in order to detect the radio waves. Marconi, with his uh, modifications, was able to turn this into a viable technology. And of course, the rest is history. Marconi made a vast amount of money out of this. And um, uh, it's rather a pity that Hertz didn't make some of it too, because he wasn't, unfortunately, the one who patented it. Now, in the case of um, radio waves, uh, the 
ripples in the water are replaced by ripples in the electric and magnetic fields. These are then detected as they travel out, detected at faraway points by watching the motion of charged particles, or in the case of uh, practical radio, um, the uh, charged particles are particles that are made to move along the surface of the antenna and drive current through a load, the load being the radio receiver. And so this is the basics behind the idea of radio, but they have some important properties as illustrated in the diagram on the slide. First of all, the electric field, magnetic field and propagation direction are mutually perpendicular. This is a very important thing that comes out of uh, Maxwell's theory. Secondly, that the electric fields and magnetic fields are not independent. In fact, they're proportional to each other, the constant of proportionality being the impedance of space, that is, a number which is about 377 ohms. Now, HF propagation is uh, basically something which we uh, think of as providing us with over the horizon prop uh, propagation. And there are two ways, or two major ways, there are other minor ways in which this can happen, but the two major ways in which this can happen is through um, refraction in the ionosphere, either the signal goes up to the ionosphere and is bent around and comes down to the receiver on the ground. This is what is known as skywave propagation, but it's a mechanism for this is refraction in a layer in the atmosphere called the ionosphere, where basically the molecules have been ionized by the radiation of the sun, and this gives a refractive property to it. Now the other form, important form, of over the horizon propagation is the surface wave propagation. In this, the waves travel along the ground, hugging the ground by a process that's known as diffraction. Diffraction as opposed to refraction for the, the sky wave. And this signal hugs the ground and travels along the ground over the horizon to the receiver. So we have two major ways in which uh, over the horizon HF propagation can happen. Let's now have a look at sky wave and surface wave propagation in a little more detail. The propagation path between the transmitter and the receiver is quite often known as a ray. And the study of uh, this propagation path is known as ray tracing. Now, the rays as they move out of, uh, out of the transmitter can go in lots of different directions. And so these paths spread out from the transmitter. Of course, what's happening is that the power from the transmitter is spreading out. And it's got a wider and wider, as it moves out, it's got a wider and wider surface area uh, to cover. And as a consequence, um, the power density gets weaker and weaker. And this is an important point because it means that the further you go away from the transmitter, the weaker the signal. In fact, the power density will drop off as one over the square of the distance from the transmitter. And this loss in power is known as spreading loss because of the spreading effect. This is all summarized basically in what's known as the Friis equation. This is a very important tool for um, people studying radio communication because it allows us to relate the power received by a receiver to the power transmitted by the transmitter. And the Friis equation, as you can see there, gives you the received power in terms of various quantities. It's equal to the power transmitted times the gain of the receiver antenna towards the transmitter times the gain of the transmitter antenna towards the receiver times this spreading loss term. And this is uh, an important equation for calculating um, whether your signal is going to get through, basically. And we'll say more about that later. But this, in a nutshell, uh, has a lot of the things which you know about. If you want a, a stronger signal, you increase the gains of the antenna or you increase the transmitter power. Of course, you can't change the distance between you and the receiver. In the case of surface wave propagation, 
Friis's equation needs modification. It needs an extra term in, in that loss term. And this term is quite important. What we'll notice is that now the loss term is 1 over the fourth power of the propagation, direct, uh, propagation distance. And this means that the power is going to call off much quicker than for a sky wave. And this is a, a very important thing to note. Uh, the power drops off so fast that one, in fact, has to use very, very great powers in order for it to be an effective communication uh, tool. In the early days of broadcasting, in fact, most of the over the horizon propagation was done via surface waves. And what this meant that in order to get a good signal out, one had to lower the frequency, basically, or, or increase the wavelength. Hence, our use of medium waves and long waves. Um, so, if you know lambda, the wavelength is on the top there, and it's lambda squared in the the Friis equation for um, surface waves. So, we need as long a wavelength as possible. So, we really go down to quite long wavelengths, um, and of course, we need great powers. In fact, uh, it was so important in the early days of broadcasting, these lower frequency waves were so important that um, by US law, uh, the hams were confined to frequencies above 1.5 megahertz, which were uh, assumed to be absolutely useless as far as anybody was concerned. And what they were doing was maintaining the spectrum for the broadcasters. So the hams being confined to those frequencies above 1.5 megahertz went up there and uh, pretty soon discovered HF propagation via sky waves. In fact, um, they were extremely successful with this on very, very low powers. And only belatedly did Marconi realize what was going on. And in 1923, he carried out experiments with short waves, what HF was, was known as there, and um, discovered what the hams had discovered and uh, uh, adopted this as a major means of long-range communication. All the rest is history. Um, uh, for many decades, every ship had a Marconi employee on it operating HF, basically. So hams were the pioneers in basically sky wave communication. So as they have been on several occasions, hams were trailblazers. What is the ionosphere? At heights above about 70 kilometers, solar radiation causes electrons to dissociate from some of the atmospheric molecules and become freely moving. This is known as a plasma and can have a significant effect on radio wave propagation. In particular, the propagation speed is found to increase with plasma density. A quantity that provides a measure of the plasma density is known as the plasma frequency. This is the frequency at which a plasma wobbles when disturbed, a bit like a wobbling jelly. And the plasma density is proportional to the square of this frequency. This slide shows the variation of daytime plasma frequency with altitude. The most dense plasma occurs in the F2 layer. This has a peak at a height of around 320 kilometers, and the plasma frequency of this peak is normally referred to as the peak plasma frequency. There are other layers at lower heights, the D and the E layer, for example. Uh, uh, but there is also an additional layer known as the F1 layer. And this is called the F1 layer because actually they belatedly discovered it after the others. And of course, they had to slot it in somewhere. So the F layer was split into the F1 and F2 layers. But all of these other layers, the F1, E and D, are minor in comparison with the F2. And most of the useful over the horizon HF over the horizon propagation occurs by means of refraction at F2 layer heights below 
the plasma peak itself. A wavefront is a constant phase surface. Um, think of the crest of a water wave. Uh, this is a wavefront, and the propagation direction is orthogonal to this wavefront. Below uh, a layer peak in the ionosphere, the plasma density, density increases with height, and as a consequently, uh, the wave velocity cr increases with height. So, when a wave enters the ionosphere, the upper part of the wavefront travels faster than the lower part, causing it to tilt, and it'll tilt towards regions of lower plasma density. If there's sufficient tilting, well, this will end up turning itself back towards the ground, and we have essentially sky wave propagation. A similar kind of thing happens in the case of ground waves. The wave speed is actually slower in the ground than it is in the, um, the, air, the air above the ground, and this is, causes the wavefront to tilt towards the ground. Of course, this can tilting continue during propagation, and as a consequence, the ground wave hugs the ground and is able to perform over-the-horizon propagation. Now, I've mentioned the idea of a peak plasma frequency before. That is the greatest plasma frequency that the ionosphere can attain, which obviously occurs at the peak of the plasma density. And this is an important concept. For a start, let's have a look at uh, uh, what happens when rays are sent out from a transmitter, located at the origin in this picture, uh, at a frequency which is above the plasma frequency, greater than the plasma frequency. Well, what we have is ray tracing, which shows how the propagation paths go. And there are several features which we need to um, focus on here. The first, there is a region known as the skip zone around the transmitter that cannot be reached by any of the radiation from the transmitter. And this means that there are regions close to the, the sender where no signal can be obtained via sky wave, that is, maybe some ground wave will get through, but certainly not sky wave. Another thing to notice about this is when the rays do start coming down, at each point um, there are two rays. Uh, we've only shown rays up to a certain elevation here, but if we carried on the elevation they would increasingly move outwards and so each point of the ground will be covered by uh, two rays i.e. there are two paths of propagation from the transmitter to any point that can receive the signal but there are lots of points where there a signal cannot be received that is in the skip zone which is a zone around the transmitter so this is the reason why you can't talk to your mate just down the road but you can talk to something, somebody um, a thousand, thousand kilometers away. You know, an interesting uh, story about that is in the early days of radios when we had lots of radio stations communicating. Um, an old operator was telling me his mate just down the road in another station, they'd send a, a signal to, um, to a distant station which would send the signal back telling the guy desk down the road it was time for tea. So a huge long distance was used to communicate in order to, uh, to get a, 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 a signal only a short distance. Okay, so that's what happens for propagation at frequencies above the plasma frequency. Now, what about propagation below the plasma frequency? Well, here we have uh, some ray tracing once again. Ray tracing is what gives us the propagation paths showing um, what happens when our wave frequency is below, less than the plasma frequency. Here we can see everywhere gets covered. So our signal gets to everyone, even close by signals. Uh, what is commonly known now as um, uh, quasi-vertical propagation. But there is only one path to each point. So below the plasma frequency, operating below the plasma frequency, there's only one path, but everywhere can receive it. Above the plasma frequency, there are two paths to any point that can receive the signal, but 
There are people, there are areas which cannot receive the signal. We have seen that um, the propagation changes quite dramatically with frequency. And what we've got in this uh, movie we're showing you here is how uh, in fairly general the, um, the propagation changes the frequency. So this is a, a path between Bath and Westmoreland in the UK for a spring evening. And the main features to, uh, to be obtained from this movie is that as you watch it, as the frequency increases, there's only one ray until the peak plasma frequency is reached at uh, 8.1 megahertz. Um, after this point, uh, the propagation splits into two parts. We're now above the peak plasma frequency. We have two parts until propagation ceases at 10.9 megahertz. So this is the maximum frequency propagation, and it's usually given a name, um, the maximum usable frequency or MUF. So it's an important concept there that there is a maximum frequency above which you can't communicate. In fact, all your propagation will go through the ionosphere and out into space. So um, aliens are about the only people you'll communicate with then. Okay. One thing that we need to take into account in looking at HF propagation is signal loss. We've already seen that there is spreading loss. In addition to this, however, there is a considerable uh, loss by absorption of radio waves in the ionosphere. Most of this loss occurs in the D region and is known as non-deviative absorption. But a small amount can also occur of absorption can occur in the F region, and this is known as deviative absorption. Now it's found that absorption loss is strongest during the day when obviously the D layer exists. This is the strongest layer of absorption. However, the strength of this absorption is proportional to one over frequency squared. So during the daytime, we tend to operate at higher frequencies to minimize the effect of this loss. Well, most of you all know that through experience. Um, but operating down at those low frequencies where that absorption is strong, well, you've still got a propagation path, but most of it's taken away from you in the ionosphere. At night, when the D layer disappears, well, um, one only has a small amount of F2 uh, layer absorption to, uh, to contend with. And so at night time, um, it's, we can go down as low as we like, and that we, we tend to operate at lower frequencies during night for not uh, for other reasons as well. But there is a further um, loss which can occur in HF propagation, and that occurs in multi-hop paths. Quite often, in order to get a very long distance, you'll need the signal need to uh, make several hops. And um, each time it uh, reflects off the ground, there's going to be a bit of a loss. Now, for C reflections, this is not too bad. C is highly conducting and Therefore, it's a bit closer to, um, to a, a, a good reflector. But on land, these losses, reflection losses, can be quite considerable. And so uh, if you've got to propagate with uh, a lot of hops over land, well, don't expect too much signal to, uh, to get there. In this uh, movie, on this slide, um, we show uh, some propagation uh, how it varies through the day. This is a, um, a communications link between Adelaide and Castlemaine for a high sunspot summer's day. And we see basically uh, moving through in local time how the propagation changes. What can also see is how the ionosphere is changing through the day. So rather than changing the frequency now in this movie, we're changing um, the time of day, which, i.e. we're changing the ionosphere, or to put it more bluntly, we're changing the the uh, peak plasma frequency. The things to be main things to be noticed about this as we go through the day is that during the night time there is very very little pop propagation because basically the frequency is well above the peak frequency and all the energy is escaping out into uh, out into space. When we move into the air early morning, the Frequency is still above the peak frequency, but not too far, and we start getting propagation. And of course, in this case, when we're above the peak frequency, this means we get both high and low rays. Until mid-morning, when the plasma frequency is high enough 
i.e. it's above 5 megahertz, and we basically get only one path. But as we move on, we see two paths. Well, the second path is actually propagation via the E layer. So this is another layer. This is the propagation for another layer coming in. Um, by late afternoon, um, basically, um, and evening, we're basically down to uh, one path uh, since um, we, 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 uh, our, our wave frequency is below the peak frequency. But by late evening, of course, the peak frequency is reduced enough to be above it, and we get two paths um, until propagation disappears during the night time. Now, one thing to notice on, uh, on this movie is that alongside each um, propagation path, we put a, a dB number, which is the loss on that path. And the thing to notice is that when we come down to this E layer propagation during the daytime, the loss on those paths are very, very much greater, you know, 30 dBs or more um, than the loss on the F layer passes. So although we've got this E layer propagation available uh, in the middle of the day, it's uh, going to be wiped out by absorption. So it's, it's not much uh, use to us. Now, up till now, we've talked about fairly localized propagation. And now I'd like to look at what happens to things more on a global scale. So what we have in this uh, slide is a map showing the distribution of peak plasma frequency. Remember, peak plasma frequency is, is the thing that really dictates what's going on. Um, <clears throat> this this is, a, is a factor which we can use for uh, determining what ionosphere is useful and what is not. Um, and this shows the distribution of peak plasma frequency across the globe for uh, uh, zero GMT or zero UT, as we tend to say now. Um, so zero here is 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 the line through um, through um, through Britain. And at that time of day, um, one can see that there is a distribution. Uh, there's this plasma almost over the whole of the planet, but um, there are significant uh, areas of non-plasma. So we'll talk about those. Daytime, uh, really, on this map, extends between 90 degrees longitude and 270 degrees longitude. Uh, but one will notice that the plasmas um, exist much outside this. Well, there's a good reason for that, is that the um, peak plasma frequency occurs in the uh, in the F2 layer, and the m peak of the F2 layer is around about 320 kilometers. So at this height, um, you're going to see day start a lot earlier and end a lot later. Also, uh, the plasma just doesn't disappear when the sun disappears. It takes time to decay. So you know, there's a it 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 stays there over a few hours as steadily the plasma. Um, decays away. So um, we've got sort of what we expect from uh, mainly the generation of plasma during the daytime, but there are a few anomalous things in that map. First of all, do you notice that the major lump of ionization, that which occurs where the sun is overhead, there's a cutout in the middle. This cutout actually follows the geomagnetic equator. Remember, the geomagnetic and um, geographic equators are slightly different, and the um, geomagnetic equator snakes around the uh, geographic equator. But that line on the map is where the geomagnetic equator is. And there's a cutout there. We may have had strong radiation from the sun, but all the ionization has disappeared. It's actually been dumped over either side. It's been moved to the side as if somebody had cut it through and, and moved it either side. That's not the only anomalous thing we're seeing in this picture. We expect most ionization to occur during the daytime when the sun is um, uh, radiating down on the earth. But have another look. Up at the higher latitudes, round about 70, 80 uh, degrees latitude, both north and south, during the night time, the ionization is strongest. Well, that goes counterintuitive. Once again, it's weak during the daytime and strong during the nighttime. So there's an, another anomalous thing. So 
the idea that it's just solely the sun that drives everything and we can get a picture of what's happening from that doesn't really wash. Um, we have something strange happening. As we've seen in the previous slide, the anomalous distribution of um, plasma in the ion sphere is in some way connected with Earth's magnetic field. This in turn is strongly affected by the solar wind. The solar wind is a wind of ionized particles which are being streaming out of the sun at a speed which uh, causes when the, the wind gets to Earth um, a shock wave around the Earth as the, the winds are deflected around the Earth. And this forms what is known as a bow shock around the Earth. Now, these, the effect of this wind is also to compress the magnetic field lines of the Earth in the uh, sunward direction of the Earth. On the leeward side, they stretch them out. So the solar wind itself is having a dramatic effect on the Earth's field lines, which are generated by um, mechanisms going on inside the Earth, but are affected by this solar wind. Now, an important thing to um, uh, know about the, um, the field lines is that they act like conducting lines for the charged particle. The physics says that the charged particles will move along these field lines. And an important thing to notice about the field lines, although most of them are closed, at the polar regions, both south and north, they're open. They stretch out into the... Um, into the um, outside medium. What this provides is a route for charged particles to get down from outside into the Earth's, uh, uh, into the Earth's polar regions. And this causes uh, some quite dramatic effects at these high latitudes. Um, at times, the particles, mainly from solar origin, can be so strong as to cause dramatic effects such as uh, aurora and these can have uh, both a dramatic visual effect obviously but also an effect on radio waves. The missing equatorial ionization which is known as the equatorial anomaly is generated through mechanisms that are related to Earth's magnetic field. In this slide we show what those mechanisms are. Basically what happens is that during the daytime when the E layer exists, uh, the winds in the atmosphere sweep the plasma across the magnetic field lines and it causes electric fields by a dynamo effect. Now the magnetic field lines, as we've mentioned earlier, act like conducting wires. And these conducting wires transfer this electric field up into the F layer. So it comes from a horizontal field, so it transfers into the F layer onto a vertical field. And this, together with the magnetic field of Earth, causes particles, uh, ionized particles in the F layer, to be driven upwards in a motor effect. So they're driven upwards. And they are driven upwards till eventually uh, they, they lose oomph and fall back along the field lines. And as they fall back along the field lines, they accumulate either side of the equator, which is the center of this diagram here. So where the motor is, is at the equator. So this ionization at the equator is basically scooped out and dumped either side. So we get a strengthening effect either side of the equator. The mag this is the geomagnetic equator and uh, a weakening effect of plasma along the equator. So this is what is the mechanism for the uh, creation of the equatorial anomaly. Now, the question is, what effect does this anomaly have on propagation? So here we see a cut through the, um, the equatorial anomaly from north to south, and we have propagation from south to north here. So this is a slice through Australia, through Alice Springs actually, and shows propagation across this anomaly. Now, the important thing about this picture is that in order to 
retain detail. We plotted um, the height of the rays, the propagation paths, against the range on the ground. And uh, this has the effect of unfolding. Remember, this propagation is around a uh, spherical Earth, but it's unfolded um, the spherical the, uh, nature onto a straight line. So um, one has to take that into account when looking at the picture. Um, the thing is that we've got lots of propagation by multi-hops to great ranges. So, you know, we've got propagation up to 7,000 kilometers there. That's where it's been stopped, goes on beyond there. Um, but the multi-hop stuff, there's quite a bit of that. Um, obviously, as it goes through the, this is this is a daytime propagation, as it goes through the um, the E layer, there's going to be quite a bit of um, non-deviative absorption, a little bit of um, deviative absorption in the F layer. But there's going to be quite a bit of it. Also, it's uh, going to lose power as it uh, hits the ground. And... Um, uh, some of that is on land, and so consequently it's going to be a lot uh, lost due to that. So those multi-hop signals can be quite weak when they arrive. Now, if you have a look at that picture, there's ones, there's propagation arriving at quite large ranges, which only has had one or maybe uh, two hops. Um, and if you have a look at that, uh, What's happening with that? We see some propagation from to about uh, 6,000 kilometers there, uh, oh, just over 5,000 kilometers, which is, hasn't hit the ground. Um, uh, and as a consequence, uh, what's going to happen with that array? Well, number one, it's um, only had a bit of a passage through the E-layer, been through the E-layer twice as opposed to many times with the other arrays. Also, um, um, the central part has missed the um, uh, coming down of the ground by the fact that what it's done is it hit one side of the anomaly and skipped over to the other side. It's what's known as a caudal mode. Of course, having unwrapped uh, the, the, um, the cord from the ground by changing to these coordinates, it's, it's, uh, it's dip downwards but in fact that in reality is a straight line so what we've got is propagation via what are known as caudal modes i.e hitting the equatorial anomaly on one side skipping over to the other side then coming down to the ground uh, which suffers very very little loss and this is an important important factor we have uh, associated with the equatorial anomaly we have anomalous propagation, caudal mode of pro uh, propagation, which can be actually quite dramatic. In fact, um, I have seen on radars uh, propagation which has skipped along across the, um, the um, uh, equatorial anomaly and arrived at the northern auroral regions. This is propagation from Australia, northern auroral regions, and they've been reflected back uh, by scattering off the aurora and come back. And so it's never hit the ground uh, at all during that propagation. It arrives back at the radar with, um, with never having hit the ground, having just skipped along um, and hit the auroral oval and come back. This is what is known as a whispering gallery mode. And uh, those of you who've been to places quite often dam walls where you can do this you can you can speak on one side and the, your sound can travel over to the other side so a whispering gallery mode is one of the things that can happen due to these rather strange ionospheric effects well what about those anomalies in the high latitudes this figure shows a view of the ionosphere looking down from the magnetic north pole so we're looking down onto earth um, on the, the the northern pole in this picture, the outer red ring is the basically is um, the mid and low latitudes. That's the ionization towards the equator and at those mid uh, latitudes. Uh, ionization basically below about uh, 50, 60 degrees, round about there. What we have looking on this is um, basically 
a ring in the middle around the um, the magnetic north pole and this is uh, known as the auroral oval now the earth's magnetic field together with the solar winds they act together to cause an electric field in these higher latitudes which conducts down into those latitudes through those open field lines and in turn drives the plasma here so there's a kind of driving effect of the electric fields caused by this like like just like we had in the motor effect in the equatorial anomaly now what happens is that it drives the plasma in the way shown by the blue flow lines those show how the plasma is flowing and what one can see is from the direction of these flow lines it's driving plasma from the day side to the night side and what happens is it scoops up plasma on the day side and dumps it on the night side and so this external influence is causing in the auroral regions uh, plasma to be dumped on the night side of the um, of the oval there so it thickens up there and of course scooping away it empties out the plasma on the on the day side so it's uh, quite important what's happening now what one also can see from this is that this is causing a region of low ionization on the sunward side between the mid-latitude um, uh, ionosphere that is the outer red ring and the the auroral oval so all that plasma is scooped up and dumped on the other side and this um, area of uh, weak ionization extends down to the other side because of course at night the mid-latitude um, ionosphere has weakened uh, there's no longer the sun driving it so steadily it is decaying in strength so obviously there's going to be um, a bit of a loss of ionization on that side so the net effect is um, an inner uh, if you like um, oval of plasma outside which is an area of little plasma going down to the mid-latitude span so this area of um, uh, uh, lower plasma has a name it is called the mid-latitude trough so um, this, uh, the auroral regions are once again influenced by the magnetic fields but in a slightly different way to the equatorial regions causing quite a complex structure there and of course if you have a look at that thing there's large regions where you're going to get very little propagation and then um, an oval where there's going to be strong propagation but in the middle of that little so obviously the complex structure in the um, uh, high latitudes is quite a problem for radio propagation there for radio communication that era uh, region there's also a lot of problems in these higher latitudes from the uh, ionized particles that come in which cause um, uh, an extremely um, extremes in in ionospheric absorption so quite often the the signals can those that get through can be um, um, uh, severely reduced by these kind of effects the result of all of this is we can see that propagation on a global scale can really be quite complex because the ionosphere changes quite considerably um, over the globe not just because of solar radiation but a lot of other things going on what we have here is uh, an indication of how propagation occurs on a global scale um, this is basically a map of propagation loss from the um, speakers uh, QTH in the UK and one can see that around this region you can see a skip zone so this is propagation at uh, 7 megahertz the fourth meter band and one can see that there's strong propagation once we get outside the skip zone so the red indicates the propagation loss so the red indicates low propagation loss whereas we're going to blue indicates high propagation loss and also superimposed on this map are some contours of the peak plasma frequency remember the peak plasma frequency is the thing that really measures the strength of of the ionosphere at a particular point so um, 
we have we can see the equatorial anomaly in the middle of that and uh, we can see how the ionosphere changes in those high latitudes it's down to about 3 megahertz but in the anomaly it's up to about 11 megahertz now there are several things to be uh, noticed from them from this figure and uh, basically uh, we could ask the question uh, what is causing uh, the lack of propagation over the most part of the uh, the US continent there well um, you'd say oh, look there's strong plasma there really good plasma oh, isn't there plenty of propagation around there well remember that at this particular time um, uh, we, we uh, the American content continent is in daytime daylight of course that means that the E and F, E and uh, D layers are going strong, and there's a lot of non-deviative absorption. So that's propagation to there is being wiped out by the daytime conditions there. So that explains what's happening there at this particular type of day. Um, 19 UT, um, uh, really in America, there's uh, we're having the 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 uh, daytime absorption wiping us out there. Um, so over towards the night time on the other side um, we can see there's plenty of propagation and an interesting feature to notice on that is if we go down to just below Australia on the right hand side of this picture you can see strong amount of propagation going towards a point this is the antipoidal point and Basically, what's happening now is that the, we have antipoidal focusing. The rays actually at the antipoidal point come together and strengthen up the signal. So um, it's quite interesting that uh, from Britain to New Zealand, we have uh, this strengthening up of the propagation due to the antipoidal focusing. Um, another interesting propagation effect. The current show slide shows um, a further example of um, uh, global propagation. Um, this time, uh, the transmitting station is, is centered on the uh, uh, speaker's um, QTH in Adelaide in Australia. And uh, here you can see the propagation stretching out um, towards Europe and uh, a very little pop propagation over America and the um, eastern side of the, the, the Pacific as expected because here we're once again in daylight and the, um, the absorption mechanisms are uh, basically uh, uh, removing all the propagation out towards there. So this propagation at 7 megahertz, the same um, frequency as the last slide and the time is the same frequency as the last slide. So you're seeing the the picture from the other point of view now um, from uh, down here in Australia towards Europe and once again um, notice the antipoidal focusing as we get towards Europe okay slightly better if we're in, uh, in New Zealand because then it lands over over the UK at the moment the antipoidal focusing is over the middle of the Atlantic and not too much use The final thing I'd like to discuss in the talk, this talk is uh, is the topic of noise. Uh, this might not seem like a propagation issue, but it is. Uh, noise is uh, broadly defined as uh, consisting of unwanted signals uh, that compete with our desired signals. Um, this will affect the signal to noise ratio and this is the important factor when uh, deciding whether you can decipher a signal as the signal to noise you know for some very narrow band modes we can do with a very small signal to noise but um, quite often uh, we need a relatively high signal to noise for things like a single sideband um, so it's the competition between our desired signal and undesired signals. The noise is the unde undesired signal. There are two sorts of noise. First of all, there's internal noise. That's created in the electronics of your equipment. So a low noise 
first amplifier will fix that. I mean, you can show that the first amplifier is the most important one. You can have rubbish after that, basically, as long as your first ampli amplifier is low noise. However, there is the external noise, and you're still at the mercy of this. You can't do anything about that with your electronics. Uh, this can come from uh, man-made sources, you know, your next door neighbor with his power drill, plasma television, you name it, you've experienced it. Galactic noise, this is stuff from the galaxy. It's very weak, but it still can come through, um, especially at much higher frequencies. And there's atmospheric noise, mainly lightning. Um, in the uh, diagram there uh, is shown typical results from the IUT model for noise. Uh, this is a major tool used by most propagation uh, uh, prediction software, and um, it's important in, in determining SNR, signal-to-noise ratio. From this, we can see that the atmospheric noise is a major source of noise at HF, certainly the lower HF frequencies, and you can't fix this by choosing a better receiver site. I mean... Um, you can try and choose a rural site, but that atmospheric noise will still come in. Local noise, man-made local thunderstorms, um, is a noise that mainly comes in by ground wave propagation. And um, it's interesting to note that um, uh, the best ground wave uh, propagation happens with vertical polarization. If you want good ground wave propagation, use vertical polarization. Horizontal polarization um, exhibits very weak um, uh, ground wave propagation. So if you're having a lot of problems with local noise, um, go horizontal is what I say. Um, it's uh, vertical could be a problem in that circumstances. Um, Non-local noise, on the other hand, is galactic noise, stuff coming in through through the uh, the ionosphere. Um, obviously, if we're very low frequencies, this won't get through because what stops or reflects you at low frequencies will stop the galactic noise getting through. It'll reflect off the ionosphere. But distant thunderstorms are something that a real problem because they can propagate via the ionosphere. A thunderstorm is lightning strikes will uh, basically um, give out uh, energy at all frequencies and uh, which means that uh, um, they're a problem for all frequencies especially at frequencies that propagate via the ionosphere. So if you're having good um, propagation, DX propagation, you're probably having good noise propagation. Um, the thing is that uh, the major source of this noise is thunderstorms and uh, they, it accumulates. We're receiving them from all over the world and they accumulate to cause uh, a, a, a lot of regular noise in the background. So I'll listen sometime and you can hear all those crashes but they're coming from all over the world. Um, to the right um, you can see a, a map of thunderstorms. It's an Australian view of the world uh, where we only have Australia, um, but you can see to the um, north uh, northwest of Australia is the um, uh, sources of noise in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, and then of course there is noise in South America, um, huge source of noise, and over in Africa there there are huge sources of noise. Um, these this map is of. Uh, strike rate of thunderstorms and um, it's a, a part of a series of maps which were made up by a series uh, by some Japanese researchers and are very useful in um, uh, investigating noise. So what you can see from that is noise comes in from particular directions. There are certain major hotspots around the world uh, creating noise and noise will come in from these directions. Here we have some maps of noise, sky maps. There is um, uh, noise coming in from different elevations. So the rings on those maps are at um, the outer ring. Obviously, is at at a zero degrees elevation, coming up to thirty, then sixty, and of course, in the central map, ninety. So these are sky maps of noise coming in. Um, we have. In top left hand corner we have uh, the noise picture at uh, Alice Springs. So you can see a lot of noise coming in from the uh, northeast from that Southeast Asian sources. 
uh, down below that we have noise in the uh, London in the UK um, there we see noise coming in from uh, basically the uh, from the east from uh, eastern sources and of course there is noise in the southeast coming in from uh, uh, or southwest rather coming in from uh, Latin America the uh, top right hand corner shows you some noise at Washington and there we have a huge amount of noise coming in from the Latin American and African sources and the bottom one shows Athens and the Mediterranean once again noise coming in from the east and noise coming in from Africa and South America so noise is highly directional and the other thing to notice about these um, pictures these are noise uh, at 10 megahertz it will change the picture will change with frequency obviously because propagation changes with frequency but this gives some general messages one noise is highly directional and noise mainly comes in at a low low angles of elevation so if you've got a an antenna that's very very sensitive to low elevations well um, unfortunately you're going to bring in a lot of noise with that once I come back to the, again I come back to the horizontal antenna is that actually um, if you look at a uh, horizontal antenna quite often the um, at low elevations uh, the noise uh, response is is quite low but it gives you good high elevation propagation so um, that's obviously good for for short distances so th there's an advantage to that in that that it will let different amounts of noise in matching your antenna to noise is an important one and this is kind of a lot of lots missed out by the modeling because it just assumes the good old uh, uh, ITU model which unfortunately assumes isotropic noise i.e. noise comes in the same from all directions i.e. any antenna will give you the same number of noise this is wrong it's quite dramatic the differences in noise uh, uh, what kind of antenna you can have one minute you can have uh, you can change from um, uh, by as much as 10 dBs or more try it sometime if you've got a well well situated vertical uh, with good uh, radials and then you have your um, your Yagi system or just your um, your dipole uh, flip between the two of them and look at that noise it's an interesting exercise this figure shows a sky map of noise on a summer evening at a wave frequency of about 50 megahertz for a station located at Alice Springs in Central Australia. It'll be noted from the this picture that strong noise comes from the uh, northwest, and its origin is the lightning hotspot hot spot in Southeast Asia. There is further significant noise coming from the south with its origin in Africa, so it's coming over the pole. Now the normal modeling assumption um, when one calculates uh, system performance is that noise is isotrop isotropic. These are the um, models that are, are put out by ITU and used by many of the, um, the major uh, propagation software um, such as vocap and things like that. Um, and what these assume is that the same noise comes in from all directions, i.e. that all antennas receive the same noise. And uh, it's worth putting that, uh, that assumption under the microscope. What we've done in this picture, we plotted on the sky map of noise, we plotted a sky map of uh, antenna gain. This is a three element Yagi, which at present is pointing northwards. Um, so you can see, plotted the contours, the different gains of the antennas. The maximum gain is around about just over 10 dB. So the central circle there, um, is uh, a 10 dB circle pointing northwards then next out comes a 5 dB then 0 dB then minus 5 dB so showing uh, the uh, response of the Yagi antenna in different uh, directions over the sky I superimposed on this sky map what is clear from this is this Yagi pointing northwards say if you're trying to communicate with Japan uh, from Australia uh, what is obvious is that uh, of the antenna's very strong response, strong gain towards those 
noise sources in Southeast Asia. So it's bringing in a lot of noise there. The African noise, well, it's right in the back lobes of the antenna. Um, there's virtually no gain down there, so that, that's not affecting it much. But that southeastern noise is affecting the antenna quite considerably. Now, what if you wanted to um, communicate instead with uh, your friends in the USA? Um, in this case, you need to turn the antenna towards the uh, northeast. And in this next slide, we show the, the noise pattern at the same time, uh, same frequency, uh, with the uh, superimposition of the Yagi gain pattern, this time the Yagi pointing towards the northeast, towards the American uh, continent. And what we'll now see is that uh, over the main noise sources, i.e. Africa and Southeast Asia, the antenna has very, very little response. And so as a consequence, there won't be much noise coming into your antenna, very, very much reduced. So towards America now, your signal to noise will be uh, really very good. So you'll be able to pick up very, very much weaker signals coming from America because they were not being competing with so much noise, that unwanted uh, signal. What you can see from all of this is directionality is extremely important um, uh, property of noise, which is feeds through into your antennas. How much noise you're going to be receiving at the station is going to depend on the kind of antenna, its orientation, and its response in the noise directions. So the assumption that's often made in most of the propagation uh, of the uh, prediction modeling that uh, all antennas receive the same noise, that noise is isotropic, really has to be called into question. And really, you can expect deviations from the, uh, the predictions of those, those uh, that modeling. You can expect uh, deviations of um, 10, uh, 10 dBs, even more. Uh, from what they predict because of the response of your antenna. So um, future models should contain this directionality of noise. And this is something I've been involved with over many years and um, uh, developing models that actually take this into account. Well, that's for all for, all for now, folks. Um, there's much more to talk about. Uh, two topics we've missed out are sporadic E and um, scatter propagation. But these are, are, are uh, mechanisms which also work at VHF and higher frequencies. So we'll leave those to a, a later talk on propagation at VHF and above. So I hope you found this interesting and I hope you, well, those of you who are still awake, uh, hopefully found it interesting. And I'll say 73s for now.